afternoon for Unlikable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, we're broadcasting here from the Think Tech Studios in Pioneer Plaza. And Likeable Science, as usual, is all about making science accessible, fun, helping people understand that science is really a vital, dynamic part of everyone's life, and everyone should revel in science. To uh, help with the revelry here today, mm -hmm. I have two guests, uh, Dr. Allison Fong and Dr. Alicia Wood Charlson. And both of them associated at this point with the Seymour program, which stands for? Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. Okay, good job, good job. <laughs> and it's uh, housed at the uh, UH, but I guess it's quasi-independent? Well, so it's a National Science Foundation um, okay. sponsored science and technology center. Okay. And it received 10 years of funding okay. in two five-year installments. And the headquarters for Seymour is located at UH Manoa. However, we have six institutions total that participate in the center. And those are across the country. Oh, okay. So we have partners on the East Coast at Woods Hole and MIT, and also partners on the West Coast at uh, Oregon State University, um, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and at UC Santa Cruz. Okay. So in total, six. Excellent, excellent. We have one more that just joined us too, Columbia. Oh, so yes, sir. One of our researchers moved to Columbia and started a position there, so there's a whole lab at Columbia University now. So. Excellent. And I didn't, I didn't introduce my guests here. I should, I should do that here. So, uh, Allison is a, uh, a graduate of the, the Seymour uh, program in the UH Manoa Department of Oceanography. She got her bachelor's in marine biology from the University of Rhode Island in 2003, a master's uh, in oceanography. Uh, and, and her doctorate also uh, in, uh, from UH Manoa here. And since 2009, she's been working as a genomics analyst uh, with the uh, Department of Cell and Molecular Biology uh, at the medical school here, studying various uh, bacteria, staph, Staphylococcus aureus, mm -hmm. different strains. And she's actually soon, very exciting, to uh, leave the country, heading off to Germany for a postdoctoral position there in the Alfred Wegener Institute and Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's going to be very exciting. Uh, Alicia uh, got her doctorate from Oregon State University in 2008 in zoology. Her carried out her thesis research though here at the Hawaii mm -hmm. Institute of Marine Biology, as I understand it, on coral symbiosis or something. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And uh, did a postdoc at Seymour on open ocean marine viruses and then was spent several years in Australia studying viruses in association with the coral reefs, with the coral in the Great Barrier Reef, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and now is back uh, working with Seymour at, as a science communication specialist. Yes. All right, excellent, excellent. Good. So let's start with maybe sort of a big picture view. What's sort of, what's, what is all this bacteria and viruses in the ocean? I mean, I, I swim in the ocean all the time. I, I hope it's re reasonably clean. <laughs> You know, this is so interesting. Right before the show began, we were talking um, with your technical staff about what are the microbial organisms living in the ocean. And at first, she, her reaction was that she was grossed out, just like you. Hopefully, they're, they're clean and uh, they're beneficial. And I think that's one of the major misconceptions about aquatic microorganisms, especially the ocean, is that are these things harmful? And more than 95% of the bacteria and the viruses and the phytoplankton that live in the ocean are extraordinarily beneficial. Huh. And they make Earth habitable. And I think, you know, part of the reason why we're participating today is to let the public know and let others know that microbes are good. Okay. And they're a really key part to climate and to Earth's habitability and to controlling, you know, simple things like the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Uh, well then, particularly in this era of climate change, they, they are even mm -hmm. more critical than ever then. Uh, yes. And we, we should certainly be studying them and figuring out what's going on, right? Yes. Okay. Well, excellent. No, that, that's, that's, that's great because, yes, there is this sort of broad perception of bacteria are bad, mm -hmm. and, but basically actually bacteria are good and only a, a few minor you know, uh, bad ones. Uh, they're, 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 so, um, so there's a whole essentially then if I understand it correctly, there's a whole sort of ecosystem that we never even see in the ocean mm -hmm. that's sort of invisible to us because of its scale and size. And there are predator, preys, parasitism, yeah. all the fun relationships happen, uh, but on a, on a micro scale. Micro scale yeah. They're the invisible majority. Uh, yeah, like the, yeah, I like to think of them as uh, small but mighty. Uh -huh. 
right? Um, and that's true. They, there's this whole ecosystem out in the ocean that we don't see and we sort of take for granted every day, but they're, they're working and they're functioning and they're responding to changes in their environment. And uh, they have interactions with one another, just as you and I would have mm -hmm. an interaction today. There are organisms across species levels that have interactions and those relationships, whether they're mutualism or commensalism, or as you were saying, parasitism, are important in how ecosystems function. Right, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible that this is so sort of only recently been sort of discovered and, and yeah. being studied. I mean, because it is so, so vital, you would think that people would have been studying it for decades and hundreds of years, but really, I mean, it's a quite a new field of research, as I understand it, right? Yeah, I think I would say that microbial oceanography has been in, parts of it have been in the works for, for decades. Mm -hmm foundationally in biogeochemistry, where you're studying the fluxes of important elements in the ocean and the physics of the ocean and how that plays a role in these large-scale processes. And now with the advent of um, a suite of microbiological tools and molecular biological tools that were developed in maybe the medical field that we're applying to environmental science, it's really pushed microbial oceanography to a new frontier. And that's allowing us to do this integrative assessment of the microbes in the ocean. And so that's why it's a really exciting place to be right now, um, because you can do things that 20 years ago we couldn't do. Right. So I would chime in about that as well. So um, most of my research with Seymour has been to work on viruses. And you know, until a couple decades ago, we didn't even know there were really viruses in the ocean or how abundant they were. You know, and now we've, we can take measurements and we can find that they're, you know, in a very small volume of seawater, um, there are hundreds of thousands of millions of viruses. If you take all the viruses in the ocean, they'll actually span the Milky Way galaxy like 60 times. Wow. Which just gives you an idea of like these viruses are highly abundant. They have to be doing something. Yeah. And they're not harmful to humans. Right. They're harmful to the bacteria. They control populations of phytoplankton or algal blooms. Uh, they do very important cycling out there to sort of maintain some of the bacterial populations and those are directly controlling a lot of the climate that we have. So, But until the technology came in, no one could actually study what they're doing. Uh -huh. So in one of the new advents too is this omics world where you can take a sample of seawater and you can put it in a machine and sequence everything that's in it and you do that and you find out the majority of stuff in there are viruses. Really? Yeah. S stunning. Uh, it's, yeah, this is, this is sort of brand new stuff. that. that most people are completely unaware of. Well, we're uh, still learning <laughs> yeah. every day, too. <laughs> no, that's, that's, well, that's, why, that's why it's science, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's fun. But that, that's uh, incredible that, that there is such a, such a huge interwoven web or webs of life there. And I think we, in a few moments we'll see a video, right, that sort of, mm -hmm. in, a, in a sort of fun and simple way, talks about this, these multiple levels of organisms. Uh, and so we're talking about the roles that these, some of these microorganisms right. play. And again, you, you, you talked on a big scale about that. And you talked about how the viruses mm -hmm. control the bacteria, which yes, in, in turn are probably controlling the phytoplankton. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that, that's there's a, a huge uh, uh, dance going on, as it were. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you'll see from the video, it's a really nice animation that the education office um, which is connected with Seymour put together. Okay. Um, and it has, it's available on the website and it has narration on it. We're just going to sort of talk through the video as it goes okay, through. Okay, let's see if we can. Uh, whoops, I'm being told we're going to start with the, the one from the, the head of Seymour or talking about the. Oh, okay. Okay, okay so yeah, we'll get sure. an overview of the center. We'll get, get an overview of Seymour instead here. The Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education or Seymour for short, is a National Science Foundation-sponsored science and technology center based at the University of Hawaii. Marine microbes impact climate change, form the base of the marine food web, and control the global cycling of biologically important elements such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and oxygen. As Louis Pasteur stated, the very great is achieved by the very small. Seymour strives to understand the big picture of microbial oceanography. Building on the foundation of research and insights from the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program, Seymour scientists analyze information from vast space and time scales, linking molecules and genes to populations and ecosystems. Discoveries abound in the field of microbial oceanography. 
Consider this, the most abundant photosynthetic marine microbe, Prochlorococcus, was discovered just 25 years ago. Given the global significance of marine microbes, Seymour researchers are required to think big and to take risks. On land, we perform laboratory experiments and devise new approaches to uncover ocean's mysteries. Our prime location provides ready access to the world's largest natural laboratory, where we perform experiments, test innovative equipment, and maintain monitoring stations. Seymour is the complete package, committed to quality research, education, and community outreach. This requires an interdisciplinary and diverse team who are invested in partnerships with scientists, students of all ages, educators, and communicators. Recognizing that the future depends on innovative scientists and an educated public, Seymour trains teachers, mentors students, and supports tomorrow's leaders as they build careers. In research and in action, Seymour is dedicated to sustainability. We participate in the long-term monitoring of carbon dioxide in the surface ocean. October 2010 saw the opening of Seymour Holly, the first LEED Platinum Certified Research Building in the state. We need scientists in a changing world. Seymour is exploring new frontiers and investing in our future. From the health of our ocean to the habitability of our planet, we invite you to come along on our voyage of discovery. And we're back here. So that was a, a, a nice introduction to Seymour, the, the, the center where you, you both work, and it's apparent from it that Seymour is an amazing sort of yeah. breadth of research mm -hmm. and also digging really deeply into certain particular areas. Um, so I mean, what's, it, what's it like to work at, at, a, at a center like this? You know? So Seymour is actually really kind of a unique experience. There's several other science and technology centers, um, but we're one of only two, I think, that work in the ocean. Um, and it's, it's a really nice experience because it's seven institutions. Um, we get together, as you can see from the video, to go on these long research cruises. So you put a bunch of scientists on a boat, you send us off to sea for a month. When we get off the boat, we all still manage to like each other. <laughs> we've got a lot of work done. We've got freezers full of samples to ship home. So Allison and I were on a cruise uh, to Big Rapa, was what the cruise was called. Yeah. And we have a video that we'll show from that later. Um, that left from the uh, coast of Chile and sailed to Easter Island, um, or Rapa Nui. And we were, for a month, on that boat in the middle of nowhere, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and sampling seawater. And so it's, it's a really fun experience because everybody is so engaged in the science um, that people will help with stuff that they're not even on their project. Nobody really gets a whole lot of sleep. Um, but the science that comes out of it is really amazing. And we had a couple of chance experiences where we had one instance where there was a, we ended up sailing right through an algal bloom. So it was like this massive patch of red that went all through the, you know, brilliant blue ocean. And like, there's an awesome video that's sort of associated with that where like scientists are coming out of all Clamoring. sorts of parts of the yeah. ship and like trying to take samples of it. And it's fun because everybody just has a good time with it and gets really excited about it. So the energy to work with a center like that um, it's quite unique because we don't get to see each other very often except for when we do these very specific cruises. Um, and Seymour has been also good because a lot of uh, individual institutions can only have one cruise a year um, because it's quite expensive and the planning that comes up, but Seymour is able to actually run several cruises a year. Um, so for example, we've had the Hoi Dillon series, which has gone out to Station Aloha, uh, which is about 100 kilometers north of where we are right now, um, and they spent months over the, the full year sampling out there to really try and get high resolution um, activities of what's going on in the microbes really close to home. Uh, to see how it changes over mm -hmm. time, over weeks and months. Exactly. Yeah. And so one of the really interesting um, studies that just got published out of that was using what's called an ESP, um, which is this new piece of equipment that we've basically designed with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is one of our, um, our center of partners. And you basically send it out, and it processes samples on its own. So you can send it out, and it'll, like, it'll actually collect samples continuously, and then you pick it up, and you can actually analyze over day, overnight, what are those, what are those microbes doing? And they found out that microbes actually have a biorhythm. They've got times that they wake up. They've got times they go to bed. They have ones that wake up at night and ones that wake up in the day. So like, it's a really interesting, complex community that we're only really starting to kind of understand. 
Um, so it's the kind of stuff like that that you wouldn't be able to do as a single faculty member in a single department. Excellent. Well, this, this is super exciting. Yeah. Before you get started, I can see you <laughs> want to jump right on in. We are going to we are gonna have to take a short break, okay. but uh, we will be back after that. Uh, so again, you're on Likeable Science here with me, your host, Ethan Allen, and I have Allison Fong and Alicia Wood Charlson with me today from Seymour, and we're talking about oceans and microbes. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Hi. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. And you're back on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. And with me today in Think Tech Studios are Drs. Alicia Wood Charlson and Dr. Allison Fong. And we're talking about the incredibly rich microbial community that lives in the ocean, all its wonderful and Myriad interactions. Uh, Alicia was just telling us about uh, some sampling on a cruise recently that happened where uh, they began to find that the, the daily rhythms and mm -hmm. uh, uh, longer term changes and shifts that these microbes do, and how different populations do different things at different times. And uh, then we were going to go to Allison, who's going to tell us a little bit about how her particular research uh, works sort of in this, in this larger context of Seymour. Right. So the other thing about Seymour that makes it special, especially as a graduate student, is that typically you work in a singular lab with a supervisor. But Seymour's really given me the opportunity to participate in these large collaborative team efforts at sea that I think I would otherwise not have been able to do. So my particular dissertation was focused on studying particles in the ocean. So for those of you who are like, what particles? Well, think about when you're snorkeling or scuba diving and visibility is not so great because there's stuff floating around. Well, those are marine particles, and they're actually ubiquitous in all aquatic ecosystems. Right. And they're little microcosms, little hot spots for where viruses and bacteria and phytoplankton live. And at those small, small scales, interesting interactions, but also interesting processes are happening that could have larger scale impacts. So are these centered around actually some little piece of grit or something? And, and then that's the a good whole question. community li living there, you're saying? Yeah, so actually these particles are made of organic material. So oftentimes um, it can be debris from larger organisms, okay. uh, things like fecal pellets or dying um, diatoms or phytoplankton. Okay. So it could be decaying material, organic material, um, so other animals and things like that. Um, but it can be things like decaying seaweed as right. well. Sure. And so they are full of nutrients and carbon, which bacteria love. And so that's why they actually colonize these particles. And they, there's a full size range, all the way to one micron to 500 microns. Some of these particles are so large and fluffy that they look like um, snow. And so they're also termed marine snow. snow. Okay. Yes. Okay. Fascinating. And, yeah. and uh, each, each and every one of them is a sort of a whole little, little ecosystem. A whole little world yeah. in and of itself. That's, mm -hmm. that's amazing to think of how many uh, worlds and there are, uh, you, you were saying, that viruses put end to end would stretch across the galaxy multiple times. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's sort of hard to envision. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it's a line of viruses would not be very thick. Uh, no, it would be, be no, you couldn't actually <laughs> see the line of viruses, but it would be there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, uh, the video that we were talking about earlier that gives us that big picture. I think yeah. that I think that's about ready to be shown okay. now. Okay. Uh, so this is the animation that we were talking yes, about that exactly. the education office put together. Right. It kind of gives us a zoomed in view. Right. So yeah, here here it's gonna come up and So I'll go ahead and sort of narrate over this. This is an animation they put together and we're basically zooming in um, at Station Aloha, which is that place I was talking about before just north of Oahu. And the idea for this video is to kind of give you a perspective on the size that we're talking about. So Ethan just mentioned you wouldn't be able to see the string of viruses, 
But as we get smaller and smaller, now you can see phytoplankton. These are things you could typically only see under a microscope. Now we're down to the level of individual cells. So this is a single cell bacteria. And those uh, little purple lunar landing looking things, those are actually the viruses. So now we're down sub-microscopic level. Um, viruses you can't really see except for with an electron microscope. Um, this virus is doing what it does best. It's infecting a bacteria, injecting its DNA, and that's one of the mechanisms by which viruses control the population because it'll actually lyse particular cells, releasing that particle stuff that was released. That's called dissolved organic matter that then other organisms use as food. Uh, so it really can change, like, change how the food web works and um, provide nutrients for other organisms. And now we're sort of seeing, uh, seeing the cells basically undergo uh, absorption of molecules. They're breathing oxygen, uh, releasing carbon dioxide. Uh, and it just gives you kind of that micro scale look. That's the scale that Seymour works on. So we're several scales below the fish that you normally see. Excellent. The stuff that the fish eats eats the stuff that we work on kind of <laughs> things. Yeah. Right. And yet it's, it's clear this is, uh, this is the stuff that the scale which the ocean is really being run at. I mean, it, yes. it, these are the things, if you were to set up an ocean, you have to make it good for the microbes first in mm -hmm. order to get the fish to be happy in it, right? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's, I've always heard it said of setting up saltwater tanks that you're really you're designing the tank to make all the microorganisms happy. happy first. So that live rock that right. you talk about, yeah, that's going to be getting the microbial community balanced okay. so that it doesn't pro like produce a disease to kill everything. It's actually self-regulating. And that will regulate the chemistry of your water, right. regulate the nutrients and the oxygen, and that's the same, exactly the same in the ocean. Right. So now as we are acidifying the ocean, okay. I guess we know mm -hmm. the ocean's going to get more and more acid for probably at least the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. What does this say about this? What, what's, what are, are these little microbes going to be happy with that? I mean, would, would they vote for this? I think <laughs> there are actually several researchers in Seymour mm -hmm. currently looking at that effect, the effect of decreasing pH in the ocean and an increase in carbon dioxide. And so um, the earlier video showed that we do both things in the laboratory and at sea. And so we can have run experiments using natural seawater on the deck of the ships and measure how m these microbes are reacting to increasing levels of CO2, which would acidify uh, seawater. Um, but the thing I think that's really key to point out is that these new findings that we are coming across every week, there's something new happening, they're really founded on work that's been done over the past two and a half decades, it, just north of Hawaii. Um, where we sit today at Station Aloha. Mm -hmm. And the work that Dave Carl and his colleagues did at the University of Hawaii in establishing the Hawaii Ocean Time Series back in the late 80s has really given us insight as to, wow, CO2 is changing right in our backyard. It's not a problem that's happening far away in the North Atlantic or only in polar regions. It's happening here in Hawaii. And we have real data that shows that that trend is occurring. And now we're be able to ask specific questions on what microbes are responsible for, you know, creating a greater buffering effect mm -hmm. and how those populations are changing. And so it's sort of this incremental building of information that, that I think otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to have. And Seymour is a really integral part of that and the university is as well. So it's exciting. Yeah, it's yeah. exciting. It, it is because, in essence, what we are doing, then, as we as a species, are, are doing a massive sort of geoengineering experiment, experiment. With, without really understanding a lot of the underlying mechanisms at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. It's just sort of beginning to now be able to peer Seems into hard, yeah. a really fundamental and critical part of what's what's responsible for keeping the oceans and the atmosphere and everything in balance and making the world habitable for us. Yes. True. And one of our challenges is. Um, this idea of a shifting baseline. So we're studying the microbial communities just to sort of understand how they function and how they regulate nutrients, microbes, um, carbon dioxide. But as we're studying them, the baseline is shifting right. because the pH is always, it's becoming more acidic. There's more carbon dioxide going in there. Um, so it's an experiment that we're trying to do experiments on. Um, so it's, it's a bit challenging sometimes, but there's some good research that's coming out of it. Yeah, I, I, I imagine it must be very tough because right, you've got, you've got nothing there's sort of no constant that you can count mm -hmm. on, and, right. and you don't sort of, you don't know where you started from. You don't know what the, mm -hmm. what the original primordial pre-human ocean looked like. Yeah. Uh, or even right. 50 what? years ago. Right. <laughs> In some right. cases. Or even 50 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, because you didn't have the tools to study it then. So the best you can do is sort of pick this up in mid, 
mid crash, as it were, mm -hmm. as, yeah. uh, as the ocean is going, going downward in its pH. Yeah. Um, predictions? <laughs> oh. uh, I wouldn't say, I'd like to not think about it as mid crash. I mean, I think okay. that these things are highly adaptable. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of how they're going to adapt and how that's going to affect the food web right. from the microbes on the way up. So, um, right. we, we may we'll, we'll end up with is a very we may end up with is a very different mm -hmm. set of microbes yeah. doing the same kinds of jobs, but they've traded roles or new ones are taking exactly. over. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, and we don't quite know all the, the side effects of that shift, right? right? But we're hoping for functional redundancy. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, we're hoping, hoping that, that nature has given us functional right. redundancy yeah. in microbes. Uh, it will fill the it'll fill the places that get left behind. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, nature's very good at nature's filling very good those, at those, those voids always. Mm -hmm. But it, it is a little uh, unsettling, I guess that might be the word to, to know mm -hmm. know what, what we're embarked on there. Right? It's going to be. It could potentially be a big change, and we don't really know how big it's going to be or how you know we can adapt to that as well. So. Yeah. Right, and, and going to be going on for decades in the future. Mm -hmm. we, we've set in motion things we can't just stop on, on a dime right. anymore. Uh, I've heard it said that the amount of heat that's already been dumped in the ocean guarantees that the ocean is going to continue to get warmer for the next mm -hmm. decades yeah. at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, again, a, that's another piece of that experiment, right, that, right. that we're doing. And we've seen just recently here around Hawaii as our ocean has gotten quite a bit warmer in, in recent months, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gotten, what, several degrees warmer than normal, and we're seeing rather ill effects of this, right? Yeah. So we did, there were a few examples in particular we wanted to sort of talk about mm -hmm. in, with microbes around Hawaii that right. have become um, sort of key points that I think people in the community will recognize. And one of them is the coral bleaching that's going on right mm -hmm. now. Um, and so there's, you know, research out at HIMB, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, the Gates Lab in particular, that are going out and doing surveys to try and see how extensive the bleaching is um, of the corals that are in Kaneohe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, again, comes back to the microbial community. So corals have a really intimate association with um, an algae that lives in them, and that algae basically is, provides food. Uh, and when the temperature gets too high, um, they don't really do very well anymore. And so when they leave, that's what actually causes the lightening of the tissue colors because right. the algae are quite brown. So the coral bleaching in itself is, again, another relationship with a microbe um, that becomes extremely important because if they don't gain their food source back, then that's when they start to die off. Right. So, and that's going on right now. And that's where all the northwestern Hawaiian Islands as well are on alert for coral bleaching. Yes, and I, I gather that there may be some corals that better basically, but, but in general the, the trend is not a healthy trend at all for the corals, uh, and the outlook is not particularly good. Uh, well, it's, but, another, it's right. another thing, just like, you know, when the temperature drops significantly in Hawaii, everybody says, oh my gosh, it's so cold. Um, the corals that live in warm tropical waters have a very, very narrow um, temperature window that they're happy in. Right. So we can put on sweaters, they can't really do that. We can put on an air conditioner, they can't really do that mm -hmm. either. So. Um, that's the only problem with living in the warm tropics, is that <laughs> anywhere else seems too hot or too cold. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to have to take a little break here, then we're going to come back and see another video and talk some more about the, this wonderful, these wonderful intermeshed webs of microbes that, that make the ocean what it is, make our whole planet what it is today. Uh, I'm here in uh, the Think Tech studios with uh, Dr. Wood Charlson and Dr. Fong, and we're talking about uh, microbes here on Likeable Science. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, we're here in the Think Tech Studios talking about uh, oceans of microbes, all the interesting microbial interactions in the ocean with a couple of researchers from Seymour here, Drs. Fong and Wood Charlson. And um, we were just discussing how the, the changes in the ocean are uh, rather a, a sort of large scale uh, geoengineering experiment that we or inadvertently put into motion uh, without really understanding all the components. 
and now are just beginning to be able to sort of look at some of the underlying mechanisms mm -hmm. and, and be able to make some guesses as to what's going on, really, in terms of the fundamental mechanisms. So uh, that's amazing stuff. And a good part of this, this community, the communities that control this, as you were pointing out earlier, live on these little tiny pieces of sediment, right? These little right. tiny things, bits of organic debris right. that are drifting through the water as, as you know, the, all the organisms Yeah, they're little aggregations. Them. Right. And it's that that's going to be shown in a, this next video on, yeah. on these, these sediment traps, right? Sediment traps are just one type of instrumentation that we use to collect particles in the ocean. Excellent. So I'll just talk our way through okay. that video. Um, so this is the primary work that I've done for my dissertation. And to collect these particles in the ocean, um, you need some instrumentation. And this is actually a very simple type of instrument. Um, and the reason it's important to look at particles is what the animation is showing right now is a very small um, subsection of what we call the biological pump. And in very simple terms, this is the ocean's ability of phytoplankton, like plant-like organisms, to photosynthesize and use sunlight and carbon dioxide and to convert that into organic materials like their biomass growing their cells and to release oxygen. Some of that material gets recycled in the upper ocean and is used as food for organisms like small shrimp-like organisms that then feed fish. And another part of that actually sinks out of the upper ocean as particles. And that's what we're seeing right here is that this material is exported. And so you can think of it as carbon dioxide enters the ocean from the atmosphere. Some of it is fixed into um, biomass in the way of small organisms, and some of that is used as food, and some of that sinks to the sea floor. And that's the way that the ocean primarily removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, balancing not only um, how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and in the oceans, but also how much um, that pH is changing. And so this is, from a biogeochemical standpoint, how particles are important. And then, as you were saying, it's an ocean of microbes out there. And so one other interesting aspect about particles is that they're their own little universe. And so part of my work is to understand what types of bacteria are associated with these sinking particles from different areas in the subtropics. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, those bacteria are then infected by the viruses that you were studying, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, so one thing I wanted to chime in about the video is you could see those really long cylindrical tubes with orange caps on them. And uh, basically what they do is they go, they get dropped into the ocean, the orange caps are taken off, and they basically just hang out at different depths in the ocean. And as particles sort of drift down, they fall into those tubes. And then when we bring those tubes up, we can cap them, and then we have where those particles were at depth, we can do experiments to say, you know, how the export is happening and where it's going to. Right. So yeah. that's Imagine what those little tubes were actually for, was to catch the stuff yeah, that they're just catch, falls out. Yeah. Right. They're just simple. That's yeah. They call sediment yeah, traps. Yeah, sediment traps. They're just a container. Just trap stuff falling traps, out. Yeah. Like sticking a glass jar in there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. You like to have a little more information about it, right? Yeah. Well, good. Um, but then, I, so what this boils down to is that you guys are really looking at some of these really fundamental uh, sort of biogeochemical mm -hmm. uh, processes that are uh, keeping our planet running smoothly, making it habitable for us and for all the other organisms that live on it, right. uh, and uh, now watching the uh, changes in the populations of this the population of organisms that, right. that run, that make this cycle happen, yeah. which is, <coughs> excuse me, a, a little bit, uh, again, a little unnerving to realize that we're, we're sort of messing with these, with, with these populations on such a broad scale, mm -hmm. so heavily, with so Minimal, no, such minimal knowledge of mm -hmm. what the impacts will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the, that, I mean, that's part of the, the reason why I think Seymour is really intriguing is right. because it's coming into its own at a time where this type of research is really needed, where we need to make those measurements and actually feed. What we haven't really discussed is that a critical component of Seymour is that we run these lab experiments and we go out into the field and collect samples and make these measurements. But the other aspect on the flip side is to also feed this data to our modelers. Mm -hmm. And these, these folks can use computational models with real data to understand predictions mm -hmm. or to make predictions about how microorganisms may respond to changes in temperature and ocean acidification and pH or changes in uh, weather patterns. And so 
the sediment trap work that I've done has two really fundamental components. The one that you were speaking of, which is this biogeochemistry of uh, the world's oceans, and the other about the microbial community and how we're altering the players. Um, but yeah, I think it's really critical to think about it in the sense of how the little things that we do, because my, my work really, quite honestly, is a very small sliver of the work that's happening, um, not just here at the center, but across the world, studying marine microorganisms. Right. And um, they all feed towards this idea of not only mechanistic understanding, but maybe even predictive power. Right, and the one other piece of Seymour is, gets into your role, right, mm -hmm. which is to share this information, which we're doing here through this kind of program, <laughs> with a, a broader audience, because it's of interest and impact, not only just to the scientists, mm -hmm. right, but clearly this stuff has huge impacts for everyone on this planet. Yeah, so Seymour, the R is research and the E is education. So, you know, for the past uh, eight years that we've been in existence, we have two more years um, that were funded by the federal government. A lot of our um, work has been to try and get that information out, especially to the local schools in Hawaii. So a lot of the stuff that we do happens, like I said, just north of here at Station Aloha. Um, and so the education component of Seymour really spends a lot of time getting that information out to the local schools um, to really educate you know, the people that grow up in Hawaii about what's going on in the ocean around them. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, what we call science kits that we put together. They're like individual curriculum-based things that teachers can use in their classroom that talk to anything about sea level rise, to acidification, to just microbial diversity in general. Um, we also have what we call a program we call micro, uh, mi microscopes in middle schools, where the kids can actually look at the microbes. Um, and so that's a big thing where we're just trying to get enough funding so that we can actually have microbes accessible to children. Uh, then we do a lot of work with the community colleges as well, trying to recruit um, students to join us in the sciences and actually create more of a foundation of scientists that are actually grew up on Hawaii, they want to do oceanography research in Hawaii when they're older. Right, because what you're trying to get here is a, is a generation of science literate mm -hmm. students and science literate adults mm -hmm. and also people who become good stewards of the planet, mm -hmm. right? right? And take care of the ocean and understand that we can't mm -hmm. just keep dumping stuff into the ocean without, without impact. Yeah, so it, it, that part of the work, that education work on a, on a broad level, mm -hmm. I think, is super critical. And, and we do that work on pretty much all of the islands across the Hawaiian. It's not just Oahu. We're on Hilo, we're on Lanai, we're on all of the islands. So we really try to emphasize that, you know, this is your ocean. This is what's going on mm -hmm. in the ocean around you. And um, education leads towards respect. So. Right. And you've got you to learn about something in order to appreciate it. Appreciate right. it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's wonderful that you're able to do that. And that this huge research infrastructure there are conduits to help mm -hmm. yeah. make sure that it gets sort of out of out beyond the bounds of science because oftentimes science has a tendency sort of to turn inward. Yeah. Scientists only talk to other scientists, and that's why it's <laughs> so great to have yeah. people like you who can talk so knowledgeably but so accessibly <laughs> on the show here. Uh, We're trying. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> no, it's 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 uh, it, it is something that's important. Uh, uh, so many scientists really speak in jargon much of the time. I'm sure you both can, oh, can yeah. hold your own in those, in those feet. <laughs> I'm very glad you haven't been doing it because I wouldn't understand a word of it. You know. uh, even though you know, I had my own mm -hmm. piece of science too, and I do understand and appreciate your idea that what you, the work you do is such a tiny, really tiny, tiny sliver. And, and sort of the, the deeper you study, the more you realize there is to study, and, and the, the smaller you see your piece of it as being. But each of those little steps is absolutely critical. Yeah. Right? Those you know, little mm -hmm. steps that we all make doing our, doing our bit of research bit by bit, like, bit like by each bit. little particle, yes, each little se se bit. sediment particle, right? Yeah, each little particle to, to contributes. <laughs> overall, right. uh, yes. We like to think about it that way, <laughs> that you're contributing, you're being an active member. Right, right. Uh, and I know, I know sometimes. But it's very collaborative, uh, as you can tell from, yeah, no, from I, what I, we've I, talked I about. Like, and your, it's a real team effort. Your, uh, those uh, uh, trips sound like they must just be yeah. uh, very exciting to do. Yeah. Probably stressful on some levels. Yeah. Uh, you don't sleep much, that's for yeah. sure. Uh, but also, uh, yes, I'm sure must build a real sense of camaraderie yeah. and you know, yeah. a shared experience yeah. to go through so many things. Oh, absolutely. That you, yeah. that you really I mean, that, that video of collecting those particles of that sediment trap deployment, mm -hmm. it actually, because of the equipment that was available to us on that particular vessel, it took eight scientists besides myself to coordinate mm -hmm. the deployment and recovery 
of those instruments. Oh, okay. So by no means is it a simple task or a solo task. So you had to be nice to all the other oh, people. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I had a lot of favors right. to pay back. We were also very that proud because it was an all-female back deck crew for most of the crew. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent, super. So well, that's that's great. Um, yeah, nice to, to get. This is, of course, we need more more women in science. Mm -hmm. So that, that must be good then to share around at the school, with the schools and also mm -hmm. sort of oh, have, yeah. have the role models there. And that's, that's very um, dynamic science, too. I mean, it's, it's, you're out there. You're, you're, out you're, there. you're not, mm -hmm. uh, not just sort of sitting quietly in a lab looking through a microscope. Right. Uh, so no, that, that's, that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's yeah and Seymour provides some of that opportunity to actual uh, science teachers to uh -huh. come and participate mm -hmm. on short cruises to Station Aloha. Oh, okay. That's through our STARS program. Yeah, there's actually a cruise that leaves on Sunday, oh, okay. uh, and they'll be out for four days. It's oh. part of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series. They okay. host um, local teachers, so anybody that's interested. Uh, it's the STARS program, and it's run through the Education Office through Seymour, and um, Jim Foley is taking a few teachers out on Sunday. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'm stuck with the Hawaii Science Teachers Association. I, I should mm -hmm. uh, have to spread the word to yeah. them about that availability, and these happen a few times a year. They happen, yeah, semi-regularly. Yeah. It's been going for a while, so I would imagine there's probably teachers in, in the program that have already gone yeah, out. Okay. But anybody new that comes is interesting, interested in going out to sea and collecting microbes. And usually you get uh, a plankton toe to take home for your classroom to look at. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, every we get really good feedback from the teachers to actually yeah, experience so it and share that with their students. So many teachers feel they lack real science, mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. science experience. and. Mm -hmm. To actually have that opportunity to sort of mm -hmm. just beyond value to yeah. be able to just sort of go out and get your hands wet yes, or uh, doing science, contributing again to, to, yep. to the scientific enterprise, and then then when you talk to your students about what science is, it's much yeah. more than just abstract thing. You know, yeah. in a very visceral way, what what you're talking about and, mm -hmm. and what what the what doing science actually entails. Yeah. yeah. I might take a moment just to sure. sort of tie Seymour back into the community a little bit more. Sure. Um, there was one sort of local, uh, when did it happen? The molasses spill. I believe that, that was, was last year, in Honolulu Harbor. In Harbor, right. Harbor, right. Harbor, there was a big molasses sure. spill. And I, I don't want to say that Seymour is a response team at all. Um, we don't usually get called for those kind of stuff. But a molasses spill is basically an introduction of sugar into the oceans. And so we had several people from Seymour go and sample and sort of look at how the microbial community changed. Uh -huh. Um, and how the microbes actually cleaned up, helped clean up the molasses spill. Cool. So, um, I mean, this is something we want to be as integrated right. as a community as we possibly can. Right. Uh, so we have people come up to see more. Um, Jay, the, the founder of Think Tech Hawaii, was actually up there, did a tour through in the, the tour through the Seymour Hale, which is the building that was built that we have all worked in. Um, that's available on the website as well. So we try to integrate as much in the community, both through the education um, and outreach stuff and through um, other interested parties as well. Super. Well, that's, this has been just super exciting, a great, uh, enlightening, entertaining uh, experience. <laughs> and I thank you both, Dr. Fong, Dr. Uh, Wood Charlson, for being with me here on Think Tech Hawaii uh, and Likeable Science. And we'll hope to see you back next week. <laughs>